Zylie Bolin, who we're going to get to hear in just a moment, is 14 years old, and she was, has been the vice president of our speech club ever since the fall. Zylie had to make a speech that fit the theme chosen by God for this contest. So Zylie's particular speech is entitled, Chosen to Walk with God. Please welcome her with me. God wasn't very personable to me as a 14-year-old until I went on a weekend church retreat and I realized I needed Jesus. Returning back to high school, my enthusiasm faded as I started pursuing the great American dream. I thought I'd done God a great big favor by accepting Christ as my savior. My prayers became self-centered. God, please help me get the perfect prom dress, or please help me get a good grade on this test. I knew I wasn't doing this Christian thing right. So I said, God, I don't want to hurt your good name or smear your reputation. I'm really living this life wrong. A few weeks after high school graduation, God answered that prayer in a way that would take me several years to accept. But I finally did accept it and even became content, truly believing that he works all things for good, even disaster. My sister asked me to go to the beach for a swim. I swam out to the raft where I couldn't touch bottom and I dived into what turned out to be an extremely shallow part of the water because there was a hidden shelf. I hit bottom, snapping my head back, crunching my fourth cervical vertebrae, severing my spinal cord. But to find Jesus in your hell is ecstasy beyond compare, and I wouldn't trade it for any amount of walking in this world. This tragic diving accident happened to Johnny Eric Sintada 50 years ago. She has been in a wheelchair ever since, without the use of her body below her shoulders. She suffered through depression. Alone, at night, she longed to cry, but when you can't wipe your eyes or your nose, crying is an ordeal. She pleaded with God, if I can't die, show me how to live. She found that the best way to battle depression was with scripture. She clung to Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not for disaster, to give you hope and a future. Johnny reached a point where she thanked God for her will, and then her emotions followed. She says, when we are weak, then he is strong. The weaker I became, the more I had to lean on him. And the more I leaned on him, the stronger he was. This is a woman who has lived these words. A nurse in the hospital commented, I was reading about your accident the other day. If your brake had occurred an inch lower, you'd still, still have use of your arms. Sad, isn't it? Johnny replied, yes, but if the brake was an inch higher, I'd be dead. God knows best, doesn't he? Despite not being able to use her arms or legs, this is a woman who has written over 50 inspirational books, published in 45 different languages, and has even received the Gold Medallion Award for Excellence in Christian Literature. She's a radio and TV host and also a truly talented artist, painting with a brush in her mouth. She says that she's left-mouthed and that she can't draw a thing with her right side. She was clearly chosen by God. Johnny is in demand as a speaker around the world. She has encouraged and given hope to thousands of disabled people. <clears throat> she has helped so many of disabled people, not only through her story, but through her organization, Johnny and Friends. Johnny and Friends is an outreach and support to the disabled helping special needs families recognize how big God is, not to be ashamed of their weaknesses, and that God chose them too. Johnny and friends have delivered over 100,000 refurbished wheelchairs around the world in needy countries where the cost of a wheelchair can equal a year's wages. Johnny tells of one paralyzed man in Africa 
who crawled to the wheelchair distribution center with flip-flops on his hands, dragging his body behind him, so grateful to finally have a wheelchair. She can even celebrate that glorious but awful, beautiful but sad, terrible but wonderful day that helped her grow so close to God. Having accomplished all this, Johnny still suffers daily with pain. Being in a chair for so many years has caused scoliosis and a displaced hip, which causes the terrible pain. She says, dealing with chronic pain every day makes quadriplegia look like a cinch. Can you imagine? And on top of it all, eight years ago, she had breast cancer and went through chemotherapy, weakening her already frail bones. But through it all, she believes that God allows circumstances to come into our lives to file down the rough edges, to smooth us into gems. I believe Johnny is a gem that shines so brightly she has even affected the life of a 14-year-old, me. At the other end of life, I want to be able to say that I have walked with God through it all. Heavenly Father, we come before you once more. God, we just thank you. Thank you for Zile's uh, speech. And uh, I'm sure all the study and the time and the hours and the heart that she put into it. Father, we can learn from everyone who follows you and walks with you. You are evident in our, all of our lives. And Father, as we study today, in the Torah, I pray that you would give us the right heart and the right mind and the right perspective that we may see clearly what you wish to communicate to us. By the way, may we be blessed by the walk of Noah and all that you convey here in your word. Father, I just pray that um, as, we, as we teach today, as we study today, you would give us your words that you would give us your spirit, impart your spirit to us that we may understand and we may teach uh, according to your will. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Where would you like to start reading? Uh, we'll read in um, 7 to the beginning. Of, might as well start at 7 to 1. But before we start, I want to make these comments. Kind of the, the focus on today's oh, talk is we're, hopefully we'll wrap up the flood stuff, which is in 7 and 8. And thanks. And um, you know, some you know, we're going to get into some proofs for, or some evidence that supports the flood. And some people go, oh, you know, what, why, why worry about that? Many believers um, do not believe that Adam and Eve, the story of creation, or the flood uh, accounts in the Bible are 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 to be interpreted literally. They're they're mythology. They're just stories that give a foundational concept to, you know, I'm really lousy at representing these other views, but they give a, a foundational concept to the beginnings of, of God's interaction with man. But they're not to be interpreted literally. The flood shouldn't be interpreted as really a watery few days where people are, and animals are killed. It's more of a metaphorical teaching about God's anger about sin. And let me tell you, the vast majority of Christendom, the vast majority of believers believe this. That it's only metaphorical. That it's only a myth. Okay? It, it's a small minority of Bible believers that believe that you should interpret it literally. Isn't that odd? Yeah. And John, let me, let me add something to that. I want, I want everybody to recall what John and I have talked about for years. Remember that the Hebrew Scriptures operate on four levels simultaneously like 96, 98% of the time. Remember, you have the literal level. That's the first. Then you have the remez. Okay? First is Peshat, literal. Then you have the remez, the hinting or the parabolic. Okay? 
And then you have the darash, the commentary, right? The wrestling it out and trying to work out the details. And then the final is the sod, the mysterious, the deep hidden things that God's trying to communicate spiritually, okay? Four levels simultaneously. So when you understand that there are rules to interpretation in, in the Hebrew scriptures, you catch that? Rules to interpretation. What's the first thing you do when you open up the word anywhere and start reading? Do you automatically assume it's metaphorical because it seems fantastical? No, the first thing you do is you understand this is literal unless it states otherwise. Okay, which level of understanding it is. And many times it's all of them at once. That's why we've talked about you can look at scriptures for years over and over and suddenly see something new that comes out on a whole different layer, okay? That's the beauty because was this written by man or was it written by God, okay? Now a man wrote it down or men wrote it down, right? But they did it by God's inspiration, okay? And some of those straight from God's mouth. Just because it contains catastrophic or miraculous events doesn't give us the right to metaphoricalize it. Now, there are some, like Adam said, there's some, some passages that are very clearly to be intended to be interpreted not literally. So like in Gener uh, Genesis um, 49, when, when um, Israel is given each son a blessing, uh, it says that Dan is like a snake. Well, is Dan really literally. a snake? Right. Or God is, is a lion? Is God really a lion? No, what it's trying to convey is some of the attributes of a lion is how God is. Some of the attributes, unfortunately for Dan, some of the attributes of a, a snake, serpent, right. a serpent, is like Dan is in his, in his heart. And he's basically warning Dan, hey, figure it out or you're in trouble. You're going to accomplish things that I don't wish. So... These passages, and we've talked about this before, people have done research the uh, computers to, to identify um, text that should and should not be understood literally in the Bible. And I talked about this when we were studying Genesis 1, the creation week, and people want to metaphoricalize that as well. Because, of course, God didn't create it in seven literal days, you know, or six, and then rested on the seventh, right? That could... We believe that mankind evolved, you know, and became mankind somewhere around one to 200,000 years ago. That's what the, the idea is. Well, when they ran the computer program that was programmed to identify poetic or metaphorical language, guess what? Genesis wasn't one of those passages, or Genesis 1 in Genesis 7 and 8, the flood accounts were not, did not show up at all. It was like a 98 percentile lang type language that should be interpreted literally. So, and that's just one example of many. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So it, to, to me, it's really sad that um, Darwinian thinking has caused, prior to... Um, uh, 18, what was it, 59, when Darwin wrote his book, um, all Christendom, or the vast, vast, vast majority of Christendom, believed in the literal inter interpretive mode. And the, Judaism. Yeah, exactly. Right. The, the main thing that switched was they didn't have a good response to their position once Darwin came out with his proposition of evolution. So they came up with the gap theory. We talked about that between day one and day two. There's a big giant gap of billions of years. That's where it all happened. And then God picked up sometime after those billions of years with day two. And we talked about that months and months and months ago, how that is completely not allowed by the text. Or they believe in the day-age theory. Each day is not a day, it's actually an age, so each age is you know, hundreds of millions of years. Easily solve the time problem. We talked about that and how it's completely um, not allowed by the Hebrew text. And furthermore, 
it's not allowed by what happens on each day. Right. You know, it's like uh, we had to wait hundreds of millions of years for the plants to get pollinated or the sun to shine down on the plants so they could produce and sugars. The, but the, that according to the text, the plants were first and the sun comes on a different day. Yeah, so, exactly. And no evolutionists, they, they all believe that the sun came first, right? And then the earth started going around, forming. These materials started to, by gravitational force, solidifying into planets. They started revolving around the sun, right? That's how they believe it happened. But, well, nobody believes the biblical order. But these day-age believers in the Bible go beyond credulity um, to try to cooperate and marry the biblical text with the evolutionary thinking. To but the John, point, isn't, isn't evolution, I have to throw this out there, isn't evolution science? Isn't it fact? Evolution, evolution is actually not science. It's a, it's, it's a philosophy, but even worse, it's probably a religion. And when you, you know, science is something that where you look and you test. So like if you're going to test gravity, you would try it here with a ball and it would go, hit the floor. Oh yeah, I just went on. Well, you'd go to Australia and try it there. And then you'd go to Russia and try it. You'd try it all over the globe, right? And you'd test it. And if you can test it, and each time you get the same results, then voila, that's science. So creation and evolution cannot be tested. We weren't there. Okay, It's not science. But what science can do is go, okay, if evolution were true, if creation were true, what would we expect to find as far as evidence scientific facts it because let me tell you if the flood happened or if uniformitarianism happened everything happens very slowly through processes that we see today that's what uniformitarianism is, is. they're going to leave different evidences behind so when you do you make a list okay if evolution happened here's what i expect to find Everything from the genome all the way to geology and the Grand Canyon, etc. You make a huge list. And then you make another list. If creation were true and the Bible were true, the earth is young. And right? where would the evidence be? Right? And where would, guess what happens? The Bible wins, hands down. That's science. But even then, you can't say, oh, I just proved creationism. You can say, I have more facts on my side than you do. Okay, all you've done is may, required evolutionists to have more faith than you have to believe in their theory. And whenever you deal with faith, if you have to believe in something more, that means it's, it's against the facts. The facts are over here but you're willing to believe over here. But God did not have it that way. For us over here, he's given us all kinds of facts for us to support our faith. He does not require blind faith. That's another religion. It's not the religion of the Bible. It's not the religion of God. God said, I've given you, in one of the Gospels, I've given you enough facts in order for you to believe. John's got a question over here. Um, there, there's a book that actually Trish and Michael uh, loaned to me called The Footsteps of Satan. And it was paralleling three particular cultic religions or faiths. The Muslim faith, the uh, Mormon faith, and Darwinism. And showing the similarities in how those religions, he was very bold about calling it that. It was a cultic religion that was established. And, um, and how those similarities have progressed um, and are established the same and have the same goals in how they um, 
are willing to get willing to get rid of uh, God and people um, in the same ways. So the fact that you just mentioned that it's a religion is so poignant because we don't recognize it that way. And so it's easier to justify, I think, to people, you know. Absolutely. I mean, the whole idea of religion is, other than the religion of the Bible, is to build man up to be God. If you look at most of the polytheistic religions around the world, and there are hundreds and have been even hundreds more, most of those, we, like Mormonism, what's the end result if you're a good boy? You become God just like Jesus, Yeshua. Was a God. He wasn't a God, but he was a good boy, and he acquired earth as his little world to rule. That's according to Mormonism. According to Mormonism here. Yeah. Okay? We're going to be just like him. And by the way, Satan is his brother. Sounds a whole lot like the Bible? No. Unfortunately, those people purport to be believers in the Bible. There's a lot of uh, occultic and cultic religions that all claim to be Christians or believers, but let me tell you, they're not at all. So these um, these other uh, religions, along with evolution, all promote this idea of lifting man up. Look at look at the religion of evolution. What has it done? It's made man the pinnacle, hasn't it? There's no God, but we have arrived at the pinnacle of evolution and we control and manage everything. It's a religion. It's not science. So, back to my point. Um, Why bother? Why can't we just have let those believers that don't believe in the literal interpretation have their myth. I just, just leave them alone. Why is this an important doctrinal position that it's a literal interpretation? We're going to find out, hopefully today if we get this far, we're going to find out that it is foundational. The New Testament goes, and Yeshua in his quotes in the Gospels, use the flood and Adam and Eve not and as mythical Noah. sometimes Noah yeah, yeah and Noah yeah they quote they actually refer to Noah as well not as mythical people mythical events but as foundational events on why God even came in the first place okay so if you mythologize these first few chapters in Genesis, can you go ahead and just mythologize the New Testament? Because the New Testament is like fulfilling the disastrous events of these first few chapters. Can we just, if, if you've got a foundational concept in the Bible and you mythologize it, doesn't it do you really need Yeshua to come and die? Or can he just die mythologically? And mythologically pay the price for our sin? We'll soon find out. Uh, yes. Am I on? Uh, so uh, the other aspect of that, that that concerns me is if if the language presents itself as factual, so if, if the creation story is presented as factual, and we say that it's myth, then it falsifies the whole premise. Yeah, that's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. That's exactly. And we'll what we're we'll get to that at the end if we have enough time. Yeah. I, these things never go as fast as we hope. Maybe it'll be next week. But <laughs> my goal is to get through my 49 pages of notes. Right. And you know I only get usually through one or two pages. Right. So. Right, right. Anyway. Oh, come um, on. Be honest. Half a page. Half a page sometimes. Yeah, yeah. 
at our Bible study on Thursday night, sometimes we get one question done. And, you know, the leaders have like hundreds of questions. We're going, one question? Right. But it's all in the learning. It's not, it's kind of like if you have a goal to read through the Bible, it can take years, and that's okay. It's not the reading of it that's important. It's the understanding of it that's important, right? And the application. Yeah. And then understanding and then what? The application. Becoming, realizing that you're like really smart. No, it's the application of it, right? So let's, let's pick it up. At, you want to do 7 1? Yeah. Okay. And we talked about this last week. Uh, Adam said to Noah, Come into the ark and you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone in this generation are righteous before me. Of every clean animal, you are to take uh, seven couples, and of the animals that are not clean, one couple. Also of the birds in the air, take seven couples in order to preserve their species throughout the earth. For in seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And that's I will... good. That's okay. Good. Um, what were they aware of here? What's the glaring thing? I mean, God, has God ever talked about, uh, you know, previous to this text, has God ever mentioned in the Bible clean and unclean animals? No, he's never no. mentioned this. Not what, in the text, not in here? Genesis. No, uh-uh. Yeah, it's, this is Genesis 7-2 here. It's the first time he mentions clean and unclean animals. Yeah, and it's not like God's going, oh, hey, Noah, I've got this thing about cleaning. Un it's not like a new thing. He already knows about this. It's an echo back to remember um, Cain and Abel yeah. making sacrifices. Of the They're not sacrificing dinosaurs, are they? They're sacrificing the same thing the Israelites 2,500 years later sacrificed on, on, in the temple. The same animals. It's interesting that um, there's continuity here. So that means obviously the sacrificial understanding and principles were already in place even here from the beginning. And, and this word here for uh, clean and pure means clean and pure, uh, but the unclean, it's, it's, um, it's used, um, it's an interesting especially in light of what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Remember, we were talking about the statue and the feet, and it's mixed with... Oh, and with, Daniel. Yeah, and Daniel, and it's talked about the uh, bronze legs, which is a mixture of tin and copper, and then the mixture of the feet with iron and clay. It's the same kind of language and intent here, and I thought it was kind of interesting because this um, unclean means mixed. And so I'm going, gee, that's, that's an interesting concept here that God is imparting in this little bit of text. And I think what he's, in addition to, he's, he's trying to hint here, I think, of something uh, in the spiritual sense as well. And so I asked myself in a spiritual sense, what am I mixing? Am I mixing holiness with unholiness in my thoughts? And or behaviors or, in my yeah. behavior. Yeah. John, how interesting that later in the text at the Tower of Babel, Babel or Bavel means confusion by mixing. Same yeah. same concept. And and what is Satan what's his par excellence? What's his primary skill at doing? He mixes a little bit of truth with all of this baloney that he's selling. He, he's, a, he's constantly, he takes something we know that we're going to die on that hill, but then he mixes it with perversion, doesn't he? And we go, well, it's got the core, and we buy into the mix. And then 30, 40, 50 years later, we bought into the whole transition of where he wants to really go with this. And we've completely thrown away the core value and we're left with his mixture. mixture. Maybe yeah. a better word is tainted. Yeah, tainted. Because that's it's what a tainted is. It's taking something impure and mixing it with something pure. Now exactly. the whole thing is tainted. Exactly. In fact, that's a definition of this word. Um, 
um, unholy. And it's, it's, it, it, in the con, it, it, it's also a word used in the context of the sacrifices and what might be tainted in a sacrifice. It's not talking about bringing a, 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 a lizard and offering it to God. It's not talking about that. What might be tainted? What might be a tainted sacrifice that God in the Old Testament like didn't like? Oh, I like that. I wasn't thinking of that. Can you yeah. repeat that? Yeah. So if you're sacrificing the right animal, but your heart is way over here, it's tainted. It's a mixture, isn't it? It's tainted. But I was thinking of something far less deep than that. Well, how about the animal's disease? There you go. I was thinking of demorphed animals. You know, Deformed, that, right. You know, something that had a mutation. Or something where it was a gimp, you know, leg. Oh, that's the one I want to give to God because that, that thing I'm going to need to get rid of anyway. I don't want the, his genes in my flock. You know, and that's what Malachi is all is, is talking about because they're doing exactly that. And the, what in Malachi, God's upset. Yeah. He's angry. <laughs> He's saying, you bring the, the, the least to me. You don't give me the best animals, the pure ones, right. the clean ones. You're bringing the tainted ones to me and expecting me to be okay with it. Now, is, is, is God saying anything about the quality of the unclean animals? No. He still called them good, didn't he? He's just saying each animal and each of us have a purpose. Remember, in the New Testament, it talks about each one of us have gifts and purposes, don't we? And we need to be about the business of finding out what we're good at, right? You have a question yes. Here? Can you yeah. repeat the exact words that the last person said? Because we could not hear. What, what she said is, that basically she was saying that it, one of the ways that we can taint a sacrifice is by an impure intent or the condition of our soul or our spirit when we offer a sacrifice. That itself can taint the sacrifice. Does that make sense? Yeah. Nathan, do we still have that um, zip that I brought a couple of weeks ago? Can we throw that up? I've got a few handouts. Uh, I, I, it, it's not a super interesting handout, but for some, <laughs> it's a lot of detailed information, so a lot of people aren't into that, So, but if you'd like one, I made 20 of them, so if somebody could, uh, would you mind handing them out, please? Any, anybody, well, yeah, even you, Donna, thank you. Uh, yes. Your hands going up again, Jessica? Oh, you want a handout. If I need to make more, let me know. Um, I just, I don't know. That's um, difficult to see up there. This is a huge read because it goes all the way into chapter 8. But what we're going to discover, how many think the flood lasted? Is this a question? Oh, okay. No. How many think that the flood lasted for 40 days? Yeah, and that's what a lot of people believe. And it, it, you should have realized that I just baited Set them you. up, that's right. Yeah, yeah, tricked you. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but it took a long time for all of that water to sink into the earth, right? Does anybody know how many days? It, if you add up all of the days, you can see it up there, and the reference points, you can see that the total is... 370 days. That's just a, a just about, over a year. Yeah, it's just over a year, right? Which is a long time to be in a boat cooped up with them stupid giraffes. <laughs> you know, they get their necks into everything, right? Oh, I think giraffes are cool. After 370 days, yeah, they're might, not cool. Yeah. They're not so cool. <laughs> it's the lions and the tigers and yeah. the alligators that I have go. more of a problem with. Yeah. With all the what? With all the refuse, huh? Yeah, all the... <laughs> Great question. Yeah. Great question. 
We're like, how many boys we got? Here's a shovel. Start bailing. Yeah. And we talked about that last week. Some people go, well, th there's no room for all the animals. Remember there was like 556 boxcar worth of space, and we did all the math, and we realized it would only be about 47%. If you figured out all the different kinds and pairs and un unclean and clean animals and birds in there. Remember, it's but, not every animal that existed. Or right. Exists. It's not the species. Right. That's not a biblical uh, definition. It's right. a kind. What has happened is, you know, we, I don't know if we talked about this, but I'll briefly mention it. You know, there's a different evolution purports that things change from one kind to another. We do not agree with that. We do agree that evolution did occur within kinds. So God started with a dog kind, and all of a sudden, boom, we've got foxes and coyotes and wolves. Those are all from the, the same, same kind. root kind. Right. Ducks or doves and pigeons are all from the same kind of animal. Right? So Not no ducks, didn't... they're a separate right. group. But there's like, there's like 50, I don't know how many, species of ducks. We're not talking species. All of those beautiful birds probably came, evolved from one pair of ducks. And within that genetic code is this... Um, Flexibility. Kind of, look around the room. Do we all look alike? Yeah, we all have two arms, two legs, heads, and some other stuff, right? And we all are human, right? But we got different hair colors. We have different facial features. Eye colors, different body types, types of body types, which we won't get into, especially in regards to mine. Um, where did that come from? It was embedded in the original genetic code. God placed this ability to respond to environmental pressures. We talked about this last week, I remember now. Remember yeah. the okay. rabbit example? Yeah. Yeah. So what were we talking about before that? How long was the flood? Oh, yeah, good yeah. point. 370 years. You do the math, you count up all the days for days, all the birds being released. Days. Not years. Oh, I'm years. sorry, yeah, days, not years. That would be really a boat trip. Long, long cruise. That would be an expensive cruise, wouldn't it? Um, 370 Now, that would give a real reason days. why Noah got drunk after the flood. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> But here's, here's a righteous guy who gets drunk after a year on an ark, stuck in the water with all these animals and his oh family. So, yeah. Um, interesting note, it's kind of like on the, the second to last little feature there on 314 days. It's, it's um, Noah removed the cover of the ark, the surface of the earth was dried up, and the ark had already previous to this point landed on the mountains of Ararat, right? And it's interesting that it's um, the new year. Now, it's the, before God brought the law in 1400 B.C., approximately, right. the new year was in, it was Nisan 1, right? The religious and, new year. Right. And right. then after the law, when did he, what month did he start the new year in? He switched it. To the seventh month. The seventh month, right? What's Rosh the name Hashanah. of the month? I'm just going to bring Tishri. it here. Tishri. Tishri one, it has Passover in it, right? So no. we shifted it. No, Rosh Hashanah. Tishri no, no. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Tishri one was the original yes. New Year, which is yes. like, what it's trumpets, right? And Nisan one is the beginning of the, the year after the law was given to Moses. And the 15th thereof is, the 14th thereof is Passover, right? right. It's the beginning of Passover at the eve of the 14th. So this is before the law, obviously. So the new year here is not in April. It's in September on trumpets. So it's interesting that obviously God has dried everything up. Things are beginning to be operational again. And it's like, it's, a, it's, like, it's kind of like a new beginning. Because when, was, when did the rabbis believe that the original creation was done? Well, 6,000 years ago, but what, what, what 
obviously he did that on my birthday. <laughs> he started to create, no. Unfortunately, it was not on that date. It was on trumpets. Yeah, the that, trumpet. If you go and look like in um, Bishop Usher's chronology, it's a giant old book um, that does some biblical research on how old this place is. He came up with about 6,000 years. He, by guidance in, from the biblical text, he proposes that it started on Tishri 1, which is trumpets. Okay? So it's interesting that he also started the new place after the flood on, on Tishri 1. So you can take this. Some people are really interested in this kind of stuff. Most people aren't. If you need a copy, let me know. I'll make some more uh, next week. How many would like? Didn't get? Okay, I'll make some more. I'll put them on the desk back here. Um, any questions regards to all of that? No questions. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about... Do we want to read anything here? Why don't you read... Well, well that's a long read. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, the rest of the text talks about this. All, All these, the details of the flood. Yeah. Birds How long things took. And, yeah. And so it rained, it rained for 40 years. The flood 40 was a lot longer than 40 yeah. years. All kinds of, not you years, keep saying days. Years. Yes. Got years in my brain. Okay, so. Well, I like what it here. says on uh, chapter 7, verse, the last verse, 24. The water held power over the earth for 150 days, it says. Which means that it covered. Yeah, they covered it all. There was no land. The right. Land, exactly. So what we want to do is, for the rest of our time, is give some evidences why, um, why we can stand very firmly on the foundation of the idea that the Bible is correct. There really was a flood. It was a universal flood. It happened over the entire globe. We'll get into some nonsense that, again, people try to play with the text. And that we have a very firm, uh, factual basis to stand on for our minority view. It, it, it really saddens me, people that... Um, I listen to and I hold in high regard about other matters that they teach on. Uh, they buy into this theory that the flood was just a myth and the age of the earth is 4.25 billion years. The age of the universe is, you know, 12 billion years. I'm going, why? Why do you persist in agreeing with so much of the Bible and so scholarly their presentations, but here they don't. I don't know, especially when we have a lot of facts that support our view. So, let's take a look at the uh, flood. The flood, um, you know, how many of you heard of the geological column? Really? Five people? All over the globe. There's, there's a column, at least as the textbooks say. You, you've got the earth, right? And it's the core base earth is made of igneous rock, which is basically uh, volcanic rock for the most part. It's, it's solidified rock and evolutionists believe that it was the core foundational rock that the earth cooled, um, the molten lava of the earth cooled down and formed this solid igneous rock, okay? On which, over time, layer after layer, and there's about 13 of these layers, were laid down over billions of years. On top of each other. On top of this, and they, they take a little section here, and go, this is the geological column. 
and, and, and here's you right here, right? We're up top on the 13th layer. And these are like called the Cambrian. How many have heard of the Cambrian? You've all heard of the Jurassic layer? You know, it's like right, Jurassic layer is like right in here. We had 13 of them. It's just a little over halfway up. And we all think because of Jurassic Park, that's where the big dinosaurs live. No, it's wrong. It was in the Cre Cre uh, Cretaceous layer, but that's not Cretaceous Park. It doesn't have a nice ring, right? It's the one below it, Jurassic, that they named the park after, which has a really cool ring, right? Now, there certainly were dinosaurs in there, but not most of the large dinosaurs. But anyway, this column you'll see in all geological textbooks. Now, let me tell you, we do not find <laughs> the geological column as it's purported to exist in the textbooks. The only place you'll find it is in the textbooks. Okay? Now you do see bits and pieces of it. You'll see little, like the Grand Canyon has a nice chunk here. And other parts all over the globe have nice chunks of it. But it doesn't exist in this form anywhere. So you're saying it's a false form given in the books? Yeah, and the reason is is they, they want to show this evolutionary um, increase in complexity. From one layer, you know, down here you have the trilobites. You know, down in the Cambrian layer you have the trilobites down here. Up here you have man. And of course, trilobites are very, not very sophisticated, not very... Uh, complex, advanced, complex. that's the word I was looking for, advanced. which is wrong. The, the trilobites, every animal we have discovered in the column is super complex. In fact, when I was in school, in, in, in college in the early 70s, you know, they used to use the word simple cell, you know, bacteria. They're just one cell for the most part, right? And you've got these little guys swimming around, and they have a flagellum, some of them, you know, a little tail, you know. And it was called the simple cell. <laughs> well, what we've discovered is there's no such thing as a simple cell. Those things, you know, remember we talked about mitochondrial Eve yeah. last week? Remember that kind of fascinating stuff? Well, this thing's full of these little factories. Mitochondria, it's got all kinds of little other organelles in there that are doing all kinds of things like trash collection, repair services. So if you broke something, you'd make a phone call to some organ that has the job to fix stuff, and they would send out a troop of fixers, and it fixes this little injury in the cell wall, or maybe even in the genome. There's little molecules that have specifically assigned to them translator genetic error fixing. So when the thing splits, there's some, many times there's errors in the genome. Well, you can't have that. Because right? then it'll fall apart. Yeah, so yet God has designed little fixers, and they come in and fix the error. How do they know what's right? I don't know. It's over my head, and nobody else knows either. Interesting point. So anyway, we got this geological column. Yeah, oh. Um, This thing is all water laden. So the geological column is full of water. Yes. Okay, so all over the globe, we have, I mean, all over the globe, we have parts of this column. Yeah, there's a few exceptions. But the vast majority of the globe, even the Alps, what do we find when we get at the top? Volcanic rock. No. It's sedimentary layers. This is sediment. That's what this is called. Sedimentary rock. And where does laid sediment down by come water. from? And what do they find up there? They find fossil clams. So you're up there standing up there next to your country's flag, and your feet, you're standing on clams. Fossils. What are they doing up there? They certainly didn't grow there or live there, right? 
there was a lot of upheaval, upheaval during some portion of our history that caused the Alps to rise up out of sedimentary rock and end up, how high is it? 30 some odd thousand feet? Yeah. I just wanted to tell a story that when I was a kid, we used to, I, I grew up in Saskatchewan in Canada, so it's just prairies and fields. And we were looking in the prairie fields for arrowheads. Wow. It's something we did for fun because there was nothing to do. <laughs> and I found a seashell in the middle of a field, a fossilized seashell when I was a kid, before I was even a believer. Wow, in Canada. Yeah, in Canada. Wow. What's it doing there? In, in the middle of that. a field where there was nothing, just yeah, a shell. There's a no water. A fossilized shell. No water anywhere near, yeah. At least not at that time there wasn't. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so this whole column is laid down by water. Now, what would you expect? Remember I started this off with, you know, you could create two columns of information. What would you expect if evolution were true? What would you expect if creationism were true? This is what you'd expect if creationism were true and the flood happened. I mean, this is a worldwide flood, right? What would you expect? The whole place covered by sedimentary rock, right? And that's what we find. Evolution wouldn't pre um, predict that. There's no reason to predict that, right? So, now it's interesting. How many have been to a place where you can see layers, like the Grand Canyon? Yeah. Or maybe even um, like a little slide, like a river's going by and it eats out the foot of a slope, and there's a big giant collapse, and you can see layers after the collapse in the remaining dirt. How many have seen stuff like that? Yep. There you that's go. Right. Exactly. That's right. Now, that's right. Now, if you take a look at soil today, or in these little cuts that you might see today, what do you find? You find like here's the top, and you got a tree here. Little bird sitting right here. <laughs> Nice. And what is the soil layer? If you would hack this and remove it so you could see down into the earth, what would you see in the first couple of feet? Well, you'd see little vestiges of roots, right? How many have seen that? Yeah. I, I've done this a million times. Used to be a builder. You cut dirt, you see roots. In fact, you don't like roots because you got to tear them out and they're a lot of trouble. What else do you see, though? Yeah, you see little worm holes, little half worms sticking out because you cut them in half when you... Sh Ow, that's got to hurt. <laughs> it's a worm, they don't... <laughs> but there's all kinds of other... What lives in the dirt? All kinds of little... Uh, what's the word? Little... Little or what? Little organisms is a word for it. I can't can't think. Microorganisms. Microorganisms. Yeah. yeah. Now I was thinking of uh, the term that talks about uh, insects in their uh, fir first stage of life. Larva. Larva. Larvae. Yeah. You'll see little canals that go down, and there'll be a little larva there of some future insect that's going to pop up out of the ground in a few months when the spring shows up and it becomes a something, right? That's what you see in this top layer, all kinds of evidence of life, right? So, you're in the Grand Canyon, right? Here's the Grand Canyon right here. And you got all these layers, right? Now, what would you expect? See, the evolutionists say that this layer took about 900,000 years to put down. That's a long time. Okay. So, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a bit. So what would you expect to find, like right here? You'd expect to find this, right? Worms, roots, all kinds of... At least evidences of them. Yeah, right at these transitional surfaces. In fact, you'd, you'd hope to find them all kinds of little... You know, each layer has micro layers. Okay, I'm not getting too technical here. But especially these primary layers, what would you expect to find? Same thing you see on our layer. Exactly. And what also do you find? You find evidence of erosion. 
or if you go outside even in this flatter area you'll find little areas where there's been more drainage than over there and you see evidence for erosion right that's what you see you find any of this you find any of these roots and larva remains or any erosion at these points if they were millions of years old you'd, you'd expect huge erosional up top here this top i mean it's like this full of erosion erosional evidence full of roots full of insect remains you don't find anything between these layers or virtually nothing now what you do find however is which is kind of intriguing if this layer these layers from here to here took, say, um, 300 million years. I'm using the exact, an actual example. They say that there's like three or four layers at the place where this is located that took, there's like three or four layers and they took like three, 400 million years. Guess what they've discovered that is in these three or four layers? They've found trees. Now, I know that there are certain trees that live a long time. Like they've found trees that live 3, 000, that are 300,000 years old. But that pales for these trees. These trees are 300 million years old. And on top of it, they grew upside down because the root ball is like this. Now, that's an interesting tree, right? You know, it must be like sucking heat out of the earth to grow, or I don't know. Obviously, this fossil tree is not 300 million years old, is it? Obviously, something catastrophic uprooted it. Uprooted it, flipped it on its head, and it got stuck in these sedimentary muds during the flood that got laid down, and the only reason we have layers is the source material changed. So it was raining really hard, flowing, either increasing the water or decreasing the water, either one. At either one of these episodes, this could have happened. And the source water that was carrying the source material off of these slopes changed. So we were getting sandstone over here, now we're getting mud mud we were getting sand over here turned into sandstone and now the source changed to mud and so now it for it's mudstone so we have might have a sandstone here and a mudstone here all rocks that formed from sedimentary water laden um, materials John haven't we seen this played out with the eruption of Mount St. Helens the same layers uh, imagery that you're showing here with uprooted trees and so on and so forth, which Mount St. Helens only took for that to take place a few months. And this... We know how old Mount St. Helen geological evidence is. But when did it go off into the 80s? So yeah. it's 30, 40, 50 years old, right? That's, that's extreme. We know how... However, the evidence... If an evolutionary geologist would go out there, they would say, oh, that's hundreds of millions of years old. But we they see, see the petrified forest there and all that. Yeah. We, it's amazing the, the evidence that's been left behind by a 50-year-old volcanic eruption has profound impacts on thinking about other Geolo geological formations. We find the exact same thing. We find huge forests that are laid down on their side. But in those cases, they're millions of years old to lay those layers down. But in this case, it took uh, a couple of minutes. All those trees were laid down by the percussion event of the volcanic explosion. It kind of makes you think, doesn't it? That maybe the uh, uniformitarian assumption might be wrong. This everything we see today, the processes we see today, can account for everything we can find in the geological column. 
That's just an assumption made up by evolutionists based on hundreds of millions of years to get here. Well, that's nothing more than a theory. We have our own theory, and I think the facts line up better with our theory than their theory. We find, you know, fossils are an interesting thing, especially um, animal this. fossils. You yeah, you can this. get rid of that. Although it is kind of nice, isn't it? Um, you don't watch out, I'm going to draw you a map. <laughs> um, we find fossils all over the place, but fossils are very difficult to form. I mean, think about it. Something dies. You, know, you run over a deer, it lays by the side of the road out in the woods, and it slowly but surely gets buried by dirt and fossilizes, right? No. That's not what happens. What happens? Every carnivore and scavenger shows up, eats that thing, hauls off legs and arms and Picks bits it apart. and pieces. Right. And in a month, is that thing still there? Maybe there might be a bone, the skull or something. And what happens to those things? Little microorganisms just chow down and turn that thing into what? Dust. What, do you ha what events do you have to have to create, to fossils. create a fossil? Catastrophic events. Because, think about it, there's in the, there's three layers um, in um, the Midwest that they claim is, uh, I don't know, hundreds of millions of years old. I don't remember the numbers. They're not important. Um, when you're trying to represent the Bible, all you have to do is say, have some information and say, these layers took several hundred million years to make. And if you average out the amount of material based on the thickness per year, you're getting a millimeter, a, 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 a a, a not a yeah a millimeter which is about that big okay that's the average de deposition per year okay so here you got this elephant it died and how many years is it going to take to bury that thing so we can have a fossilized evidence which by the way we find lots of fossilized evidence as elephants especially near the Arctic Circle so how many years? Is that thing going to make it? Of course not. That thing's going to be that is going to be a party around that thing for months until that thing is completely consumed and picked clean. And picked clean. The bones are being hauled off. It's not going to last. And its burial rate per year isn't going to help. So in, these, in this area in the Midwest, we find billions, not millions, billions of fossils. That means a great cataclysmic event took place. How did they get there? The only way these kinds of things are going to be left in this geological column is by catastrophism. Let's get the microphone, please. Oop. Is it on? Green? Hello, hello? Just make sure it's good. Yeah. There you go. I've always wondered how it is. The only thing I assumed was it must be like in a wash basin or something where millions form, or millions are found in certain areas. I always just assume they're buried by all the sediment deeply in other areas, but certain areas seem to be closer to, um, you know, the surface of the earth. Is it just because that was like the final washout basin, so water was still flowing over it and kept the sediment from covering them up deeply? Certain areas just... Well, you're saying where they find millions? They, they seem to find um, remnant fossils um, in certain areas more than others. 
And the only thing I could think was, and I'd never read anything yet, even from Christian science guys that I've read, um, like Ken Ham and the other guys, they don't ever explain why it is that there's certain fossil beds that are much more accessible um, when, you know, global flood, it would all settle down, you'd think, un um, uniformly across the planet, and yet they find fossil beds. So the only thing I assumed was that these are like the wash basins, so even as the bones settled, the, the rain was still flowing to the sea or something, so it left a thin layer of sediment rather than huge, thick layers. We find these, you're correct, the fossils tend to be concentrated, uh, but they're ubiquitous. We find them everywhere, all over the globe, um, especially uh, sessile animals that don't move or don't move very fast, um, like starfish, you know, they're never going to win a, a race, are they? Um, because they can't move very fast. They're going to get buried very quickly, but we do find concentrations, certainly. And this one concentration that I'm referring to, which is in north-central U.S., uh, there, there's hundreds of millions, billions of fossil remains. And the, the one comment that I want to say about it is you, know, you walk up to these beds, and it's very difficult to find a whole animal. What you find is the, okay, hundreds of thousands of, of large animals here. They're torn bit to bit. The legs are all ripped off heads. They're decapitated. How does that, what? Is that, is that some natural kind of thing that's going to happen over hundreds of millions of years? How did that happen? Their conglomerate, obviously, the flood torn these animals apart. They were flowing over, you know, terrain that ripped them. They were probably, um, like you mentioned, circular flows during the flood, and they just got completely ripped apart and then buried. I can't think, and we're not talking about, you know, five-acre plot here. We're talking many square miles that we, we find these kinds of fossils in, yes. Well, there are also still mountains and everything there because you hear about the flood going taller than the mountains by, what, 25 feet or something like that with the water to cover up all the mountains so that the earth is completely covered. So you have the mountains where, you know, if the water is going to be rushing around, they're going to accumulate in places like that and get beaten up and... Yeah, and true. I... Do you know that most of the mountain chains by evolutionists believe that... They believe that most of the mountain chains are very young. They're not, like, ancient. They're, they're young. And not by our standards, like... We think that these, these mountain chains were, in fact, my view is, and many creationists' view, is that most of these huge, giant mountain chains were made during the flood. That's why God needed a boat to put everything that he held precious in that wouldn't tip over and sink. Now, I think that that verse that you're alluding to that talks about 20, 30 feet above the, I think that that's Noah's reference he, he's making two comments. The water, the, if you're in a boat, what do you care about? How high the water's rising up on the side of the boat, right? And he also throws in the idea that, oh, we didn't hit any mountains because we the water was above the mountains. I think that the pre-flood geography was vastly different. I think it was not high mountains that prevailed. I think it was mostly low lying. And why do I think that? In other words, hills? Yeah, hills mostly. Yeah. What happens when um, wind blows against the side of a mountain chain? It just goes right through the dirt. No, it, it goes up, right? And what happens when air goes up? It cools, water condenses because water it, it, has, it lowers its ability to hold water by cooling, and cooling air eventually forms clouds, and what happens under clouds many times? It rains. And what do we know? 
we know there's several passages that make the point pretty clear it didn't rain in those days. We're going to get to that in the next chapter. So we can't have tall mountains, otherwise we're going to have rain. And God gave them a covenant based on the fact that there had never been a rainbow. Well, if you've got rain and the sun, you're going to have rainbows, period. But prior to the flood, no rainbows. No rainbows. Okay, we'll get to that more down the road. Um, so I think that pre-flood geography was much more mild and uh, different than what we have today during the flood. Um, in fact, I've got a verse. John, let's get his hand up. Yeah, here. go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to point out uh, when you were talking about the dinosaur bones being broken apart and mixed all over, the, the dinosaur bones being mixed around the, the earth and not always together. I mean, if you look at basic videos of things like flash floods, which is extremely basic in contrast to a uh, catastrophe, um, look at all the debris that's mixed into those. It's like mud and trees and parts of houses and cars and all kinds right. of things moving very fast, and that's nothing compared to the Great Flood. That's right. That's correct. Cool. Exactly. A lot of people try to get out of this whole flood, and this is Christian dump. They try to go, you know, because this is a big, big problem. They think this flood story. So they go, okay, it was a local flood. Right? Well, that works, doesn't it? Well, why doesn't it work? Well, first off, the text says it covered the whole earth, but there's lots of problems. Why include birds? Let's just fly into the next valley where there's no flood, right? Why include any animals at all? Because they can just migrate, or how many, how many kinds only exist in this little flood area? Probably none. So why not? Just, why build a boat at all? Noah, just climb over that little ridge, and you'll be fine. Hang out for a little while, then come on back. Local floods don't work, do they? Plus, the Bible says, like I said, it that it was a worldwide flood. There's another question here. Well, what I was going to say is where it really came years ago, my husband and I, he being from Utah, we'd go back and visit his fin, and we went to Dinosaur National Monument, and you can really see it there because they, they had, at that time, they were big mouth. They, they were clearing out, and they showed you where still bones and everything was in the and, and then it showed you what they had put together from those bones sure. and everything you can see that and then when i worked years a few years ago also when i worked for the forest service and i drove uh informational um bus up lava butte and i told you know told them about the, the lava fields and how lava right. butte was formed and how pilot butte was formed and how you know but then I got the, to go with a geologist. There was several, there was a group of us that got to go with a Forest Service geologist all around, and he pointed out, he knew where to go, and he said, well, here, and he'd point out the layers of whether it was ash or whether it was uh, from, you know, and until you get to see that, you don't realize how Central Oregon is a treasure trove of a right. lot of stuff from earthquakes Yep. which we had volcanic activity and volcanic and, yeah. activity sure. yeah it was very interesting and that's the only reason i would have never known a lot of the things i do if i hadn't have seen it you know great very good the, this there's another question over here um this the, the flood e evidence is profound these layers that i had up here they're not a few square miles some of these layers cover geographical areas that laugh at the local flood concept. Remember, they're all laid, they're water laid down, right? All laid down by water. Some of these layers, starting in the Grand Canyon, they go all the way to Maine, all the way to Canada, and all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. It's not a little like a little state. Then I'd go, okay, maybe there's evidence for a local flood. That's ridiculous. The only thing that's gonna lay down a sheet of mud or sandstone that big. that big is a worldwide flood and guess what that's not just just 
in the United States where we find that kind of evidence. It's all over the world. We find massive, hundreds of thousands of square miles area covered by some of these layers. Yeah. Uh, John, in support of your notion that... What? In support of your idea that our terrain was more moderate, um, it's very simple. If you have the geosynclines and geoanticlines, and you have the dynamic forces of the Earth, any of the things that were laid down by the water at any level are at some point going to in, be engaged in upheaval. So when you have continental forces that are pushing mountains up, then if you go to the Appalachians, you can discover that that perfect cone that you're illustrating actually doesn't exist on, almost anywhere. Because if you go to the Rockies or the Alps, you'll see these layers at deep angles. And in the Appalachians, they not only have gone up, they have completely tipped over Glad and turned things that. upside down. Yeah. <laughs> so you, that would explain the uneven distribution of many of the things that were laid down maybe at one time at a lower level, and they're now at a higher level. You can go to the top of the Rockies and find trilobites. Yeah, that's right. This, I don't, you know, if we had these flat layers, well, guess what? They're all over the place. I've seen them myself. In fact, on Route 66, going from LA to Albuquerque, there's a beautiful formation of what I'm about to draw, which I'm sure will be a beautiful picture. <laughs> Normally, the layers are like this, right? Well, in this place, the, they're obviously laid down, okay, in one layer, but they go like this. That's the layer. This is not a valley. Okay, and if it was a valley, I mean, this is all probably, oh, maybe 300 feet, and this is like 50 feet, and this is all the same kind of rock. We find this all over the place, not just on Route 66. I mean, not just a nice, neat layer like you have yeah. up there on the left. How does this form? It has to be soft when it got laid down like this, and then there was some volcanism or some earthquake activity that caused it to get deformed like this, right? We're out of time again. I don't know what happens, but um, <laughs> it's fun. It's fun information, isn't it? I, I, I wallow in this stuff. I, I really enjoy it because I like to be able to um, have an answer for everybody that, and there's a lot of people out there asking questions, and many times we don't have answers. And so I want to be one of those guys that do. I want to be able to defend my faith, plus my own, for my own sake, I want to be able to have an answer. I don't like it when I go, huh, that's a good point. I don't have an, I don't have an argument for that. Well, I, don't I, think have, that I can't defend myself. I think one of the best points is that science and scripture are not opposed to one another. No. What you're discovering is that this, as you said, where's the evidence for either side? And as you start to look at, the, at some of the facts and the evidence, it starts to lend itself weightier on the side of creation versus evolution. Exactly. I'll read this to you. Um, it's uh, Psalms 104, 8 and 9. It says, <laughs> David obviously wrote most of Psalms. I'm not sure if he wrote this one, but... Um, Obviously, David wrote about 1,000 B.C., so this is way after the flood, right? It says, uh, the mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place which you established for them. Yet you set a boundary that they may not pass over so that they will not return to covering the earth. Interesting passage, isn't it? Implying what? That they used to cover the earth. So after the flood, God drew a line in the sand, maybe literally, and said, see, you're on ocean, you're on that side, land, you're on this side. This is the boundary, you have to stay over here, land, this is the boundary, you get to stay over here, and you're not going to be, what did God promise? 
that he would never inundate the globe again with a watery, catastrophic event, which is another excellent argument to the local flood guys. If it's a local flood, have there ever been any flood? I think there's been floods this year that have been catastrophic by the people who've lost their homes. So God's a liar. That's what you're left with if you have interpreted this as a local flood idea. No, there's been hundreds of thousands of local floods. This flood is not a local flood. It's a worldwide flood. The point is, is that we don't have time to get to the New Testament. We'll get to that maybe yeah, next, week. next week. But the stuff we've covered, try to grab a hold of a few little bits. Because let me tell you, the evolutionists won't have answers unless you're talking with a Ph.D. guy, and then he'll try to come up with something. But most people will sit there and go, what? They haven't heard rebuttals to the programming they've received. Have rebuttal. Have evidence. Just throw it on the table. And you're not going to win them over, maybe, that day. What you want to do is stir the pot. Because that gets somebody thinking. An atheist thinking. If, you're, if you can stir the pot by a couple of little one-liners, you get them to go and start doing the research and let God speak to them through that little one-liner factoid you threw at them, guess what happened? That's how, that's the, many times the end of the road where you reap salvation. The little seed corn that started was somebody with a little bit of information that really messed up their day. So I encourage all of us to be able to ruffle feathers in a positive way to get them to seek truth themselves and realize maybe they don't have, they're not the end all to all philosophical and geographical and any other mode of science knowledge. Yeah. Um, that was really amazing, and I just, I kind of want to just go back to Genesis 7, 1, where it says, uh, for I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation, and it kind of ties back to that, that, you know, we need to look at Noah as that example to be righteous for the next one, because I don't want to be unrighteous before the Lord when he comes again. And so we should always look to that and remember to be righteous as Noah was righteous. Good point. God is, which you may not want to hear, he's measuring you. For salvation? Yeah, but how do you get salvation? Through faith. But he's also measuring you a different way, isn't he? And this is what Noah, why he found favor. It's because God was measuring him. Ugh. How many want to be measured? How many like to be measured in by the professor? Be a test? No, that's not my favorite thing. How many of us like to be measured by the boss? We all love those times once a year where the boss calls you in. And For an evaluation? He, yeah, yeah, gives you an evaluation. We love those days, right? No. The only part we like about it is if we score well, they might give us a raise, right? But the process, that's not what we gravitate toward. We don't like to be measured, but God's going to measure too. And it's the most important measuring that you will ever experience in your life. So the motivation is, hmm, I wonder what his measuring rod is. Amen? I wanted to end it with this, is that... Uh... In the text here with Noah, what always stands out for me is how God took care of life. His whole purpose here was not just punishment. His whole purpose was to take care of the righteous ones. Okay, And he saw the animals. He, he took care of the animals as well. We always miss that. You know, I, I always talk about individuals who 
are angry at suffering and pain in the world and things that go on. And I can understand that. And sometimes that frustration and that anger is valid that when you see evil in the world. But here's a firsthand account of God looking out for his creation to protect it and keep it safe. Why don't we focus on the love that's there? That's what God's saying. He goes, look, there's so much evil in the world. If I let it go, these few righteous and all of life is going to be destroyed. And God's saying, no, I'm intervening. And he obviously saw the best way to do that. It's kind of like when we're dirty, how do you clean yourself? You wash with water, right? God's doing the same thing with the earth back then. He goes, it's dirty. It's filthy. It's going to be diseased. It is diseased. Here's one healthy part here. I need to take that out and keep it safe. Quarantine it, if you will. And I need to wash everything clean with water. That's what he's doing. It's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. It's a loving thing. And those are the things we need to focus on as well when we read the scriptures. God is intervening directly in his creation, which tells me he's paying attention to every single detail there. He's paying attention. And so the question we need to ask when bad things happen is, not God, where are you? Because we're seeing over and over in scripture, God is very much paying attention and he's very much present. What we need to say is, what are you trying to do here? What am I not seeing that you're doing? Am I supposed to be the righteous individual that stands out for this generation? Is that what he's saying? And he's waiting for me to pay attention to him? Those are the kind of questions we need to ask. And so as we read these things, we should be encouraged. When we see darkness in the world, as I've always said, you know, when things get darkest in Scripture, that's when we see some of the greatest miracles take place. We should be excited and lining ourselves up with individuals in Scripture that were righteous and holy and lining themselves up with God. That's the response we need to have. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We bless you and we thank you. Father, we thank you that you care so much for your creation that you will go to any length to protect it, to cleanse it of evil and corruption. And Father, that you directly intervene to, in our lives even to bring out what is holy and good and righteous. So Father, we love you. We bless you. We thank you for all the wisdom that you give in your word. In your word and even in, in the sciences. Father, that there is evidence there that lends itself to your story here. Your story that is truth and history, not just a myth. So, Father, I pray your blessing on everyone here as they leave this, uh, this Sabbath. I pray that they would have a restful and peaceful Shabbat and that they would reconnect with you and with one another. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Please rise.